Good afternoon and welcome to Facebook Live with Holy Cross Health. My name is Brenton Andrasik, Manager of Physician Alignment and Business Development for Holy Cross Health. Before we begin, I'd like to call your attention to a few ground rules that you'll see in the comments section. We encourage you to participate, but please keep any questions and comments general. We won't be discussing anyone's specific health situation today in this public forum. If we can't get to every question today, we'll provide additional feedback through our Holy Cross Health online channels. Today we're discussing disorders of the thyroid and more specifically thyroid nodules. And judging by the number of registrations and questions we received, it seems like this is one of the topics that you are most interested in, so we're happy to be your source for information that you can trust. We're here with Dr. David Bianchi, ear, nose, and throat surgeon, and Dr. Kavita Iyengar, endocrinologist. Dr. Bianchi has nearly 40 years of experience practicing medicine and surgery in the military and federal and private sectors. Dr. Bianchi specializes in treating diseases and disorders of the head and neck, including the ears, nose, and throat. Dr. Iyengar has been in practice for more than 20 years. Dr. Iyengar specializes in treating diabetes, disorders of the thyroid, pituitary, adrenals, and reproductive and bone health. So, first of all, Dr. Bianchi, can you tell us what is the thyroid, where is it, and what function does it serve in our bodies? Thanks for having me here today. The thyroid gland is uh, one of the glands of the endocrine system. Uh, the uh, thyroid gland is located in the lower part of the neck, uh, just below the Adam's apple overlying the windpipe in the central portion of the neck. It's shaped uh, much like a U, and it is the body's thermostat. Uh, it sets the basal metabolic rate. In many ways, the thyroid gland determines whether someone is active or somnolent, whether they're thin or, or th fat. And Dr. Angar, as I mentioned at the top, we're here to mostly talk about thyroid nodules. But before we dive into that, could you just give us a brief overview of thyroid disorders in general? Uh, people are probably familiar with the terms hypo and hyperthyroidism. What does that mean? And what might patients experience with those disorders? Sure. So the thyroid uh, helps with the body's metabolism. Uh, the thyroid gland makes two types of hormones, T4 and T3, that regulate virtually every part of the body's function. Uh, if the thyroid makes too little thyroid hormone, we call it hypothyroidism. That's where people have an underactive thyroid where uh, everything slows down. So people feel tired, cold, and constipated. They gain weight and they have memory problems. Uh, we treat that easily with a thyroid hormone supplement, which is a pill a day. On the other hand, if the thyroid makes too much thyroid hormone, we call that hyperthyroidism, where the metabolism is revved up. Everything moves faster than it should. Uh, people feel anxious, nervous, they have trouble sleeping, they could have palpitations or tremors, um, and we treat that with medications that cool down the thyroid, make it make less thyroid hormone. Sometimes that can also be treated with radioactive iodine or surgery. Thank you, Dr. Angar. I know that's compressing a very large topic into a very short amount of time, so I appreciate that. So with that in mind, Dr. Bianchi, I'd like to move into our specific topic for today, could you tell us what exactly is a thyroid nodule and what sort of symptoms do they present with? Well, first of all, thyroid nodules are very common. Uh, we think that uh, maybe as many as half of the people walking on the street may have thyroid nodules that they're unaware of. A nodule is uh, just that, a nodule or a small uh, tumor or lump within the thyroid gland. Most often they occur in multiples. And uh, when someone has a nodule in their thyroid gland or multiple nodules in their thyroid gland, it's termed a goiter. Uh, and a goiter is simply a benign uh, uh, lumpy thyroid gland that may be slightly enlarged. Uh, nodules can be uh, of a benign sort, and nodules can be more concerning in, in terms of being uh, malignancy or thyroid cancer. I'm glad that you mentioned goiters and the difference between goiters versus nodules. Um, you know, with that in mind, Dr. Angar, uh, I'd like to address a question that we got from folks who pre-registered. Uh, we'll have several of those that we go through throughout our time this afternoon. Um, but I had a related question. Someone asked, what's the difference between a thyroid nodule and a cyst? 
Um, so a goiter is an enlarged thyroid. Uh, the goiter can come either from nodules or the whole gland itself is enlarged. Um, nodules can either be solid or fluid filled. So when a nodule or a growth within the thyroid is filled with fluid, we call that a cyst. Um, the chance of cancer in thyroid cysts is very, very low. Uh, solid nodules have a slightly higher chance of having cancer. So cysts are more benign nodules. And Dr. Bianchi, we had another question about anatomy, so I'll address this one to you. Someone asked, can nodules ever show up on the back of the neck? No, thyroid nodules are found on the front of the neck. That's where the thyroid gland is. It would be a very unusual circumstance to have thyroid tissue or nodules in the back of the neck. Uh, lumps and bumps on the back of the neck are more commonly uh, of the variety uh, relating to fat cell tumors or uh, muscle tumors of the back of the neck. And Dr. Bianchi, what in general causes thyroid nodules to form, and are there any risk factors that make it more likely and that people should know about? So thyroid nodules occur without any inciting event. Uh, we know that radiation exposure early in life, uh, or at any time in life, uh, can lead to the development of thyroid nodules and malignancies uh, with a much higher rate in those people who are exposed to uh, radiation. And this can be in the form of uh, therapeutic radiation for treatment of cancers in youth or uh, being exposed to fallout, such as uh, was seen around Three Mile Island or Chernobyl or uh, Fukushima. So uh, thyroid nodules, in the large majority of people who have thyroid nodules, they occur spontaneously and with no known inciting event. And, and with that in mind, Dr. Bianchi, are there any screening tests that people should get to check for nodules, and how do most people find out that they have them? So at this point in time, we don't routinely screen the general population for thyroid nodules. Knowing that thyroid nodules are so prevalent in our population, uh, it would not make sense to screen people for something that is so prevalent. Uh, most of the referrals that Dr. Iyengar and myself see in the clinics uh, are to evaluate thyroid nodules that are found incidentally during imaging studies that are done to evaluate other medical problems, such as carotid ultrasonography done to evaluate the patency of the large vessels in the neck. Or nowadays, we have low-dose screening CT scans to screen people for lung cancer, and we're seeing a large number of patients being incidentally diagnosed with thyroid nodules uh, with these low-dose CT scans. Any other imaging study that uh, is done for, say, spine disease of the neck, uh, uh, for headaches, I've seen people who have had cranial MRIs that scan low enough into the neck, and incidental detection of thyroid nodules is found, and they're referred to us for evaluation. And Dr. Angar, when we do find something that requires further workup, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about diagnosis and what that workup process looks like for a patient? Sure. So although thyroid nodules might be found incidentally from other imaging studies like CAT scans and MRIs, the best imaging study to view nodules in the thyroid is an ultrasound. So an ultrasound is a very simple bedside procedure. I have it in my office. Holy Cross has a radiology center where ultrasounds can be done. Um, and nowadays, the images that we see are so clear and so sharp, much better than it used to be even five or 10 years ago. Uh, so it's a simple bedside procedure using a probe where we um, you know, look at the thyroid and uh, at nodules in the thyroid. Um, we look at features of the nodule, so the size, the shape, uh, and other features uh, to determine if uh, it meets the criteria for a biopsy, which is really a needle aspiration. Uh, first, we have to make sure that the nodule is not producing too much thyroid hormone, um, which can be done with blood testing and a nuclear medicine scan if needed. Um, if it is determined that the nodule meets the criteria for a biopsy, then um, the ultrasound-guided fine needle aspiration is another very simple bedside procedure that can be done in the office. 
Um, so looking under the ultrasound, we would stick a needle right into the nodule, uh, draw some cells out into the syringe, and then apply that on slides and send it off to the lab. The cytopathologist then looks at the sample under the microscope and tells us if they see benign cells or malignant cells. Occasionally, uh, some of these biopsy samples come back reading indeterminate, meaning that they are not able to tell us for sure if they see benign or malignant cells because there may be some atypical features, in which case we now have the luxury of molecular testing uh, in the same sample that's sent off to the lab. And that involves looking at multiple genes which are associated with thyroid cancer. Um, and they are able to tell us if the patient has a higher probability of having cancer in the sample based on the genes that they look at. And while we're on the subject of biopsy, we had a question from uh, of someone who pre-registered. I'm going to paraphrase a bit, but essentially they wanted to know how do you approach the biopsy of nodules that are smaller in scale? The reason why we do biopsies is to look for cancer. And the chance of having a cancer in nodules that are smaller is very, very low. Uh, nodules larger than one or one and a half centimeters typically meet the criteria. We do look at other features in the nodule, like I mentioned the size, also the shape. Uh, the borders, if they are well defined or not, the blood flow within the nodule, whether it has calcium deposits or not. So we take into account all of these features before we perform a biopsy. We almost never perform a needle aspiration in a nodule that's under a centimeter in size, uh, because if you imagine a centimeter is the size of a pea and having to go through layers of skin and muscle and fatty tissue with the needle into the size of a pea or smaller um, makes it really difficult to get a good sample. And Dr. Bianchi, uh, we've had a, a few other questions come in, so I want to address this one to you. Uh, someone said, I'm 81 years old and have been a type 1 diabetic for 48 years. I have a few very small thyroid nodules and then a three and a half centimeter nodule on the left. The appearance is generally benign. How urgent is my need for a biopsy? So this, this patient who's asking this question is asking about the approach to what we would term a dominant nodule. Uh, multiple small nodules, but one is not behaving right. One is uh, growing out of proportion to the others and is 3.5 centimeters, which is well over an inch in diameter. Uh, that's a ping pong ball. So when one nodule becomes dominantly enlarging like that, we do recommend biopsying it. Now, an 80-year-old individual uh, even if found to have thyroid cancer, most likely is going to outlive the thyroid cancer because it's such a low uh, type, of low uh, malignancy grade uh, tumor. But nonetheless, we do see people in their 80s who have dominant nodules discovered on other imaging studies because that's the age that we're usually doing carotid ultrasounds and, uh, and imaging for other reasons. And we would recommend an approach with an ultrasound uh, guided fine needle aspiration um, to evaluate whether there's high risk with that nodule or not. And Dr. Yangar, uh, we touched on this, but just for clarity's sake, someone did ask, uh, does a goiter mean cancer? Uh, so a goiter most of the times does not mean cancer. Most goiters or enlarged thyroid glands are benign. Uh, the risk of cancer is higher if there is a nodule or a growth within the thyroid that has suspicious features on ultrasound that I mentioned before. Uh, in fact, 90 to 95 percent of nodules within the thyroid are benign, so the chance of a cancer is about 5 percent, which is very low. And we did have a question just come in, so I think we'll insert it here. Uh, as we transition to, to talk about treatments next. But before we do that, uh, someone asked, I had a baby four months ago and was just diagnosed with a complex nodule and a fluid nodule. Uh, so Dr. Dr. Bianchi, I will address this to you. Can thyroid nodules go away on their own? So this is a very interesting case scenario. Uh, pregnant women 
uh, have enlargement of the thyroid gl gland while they're carrying their babies. Uh, and this is quite normal. And the time for students uh, to learn how to palpate and feel thyroid glands is in the obstetrics clinic, uh, feeling the necks of pregnant women. Uh, very often during pregnancy, the thyroid gland may enlarge and become somewhat nodular. And with parturition, the baby is delivered, the thyroid may settle down and almost always does uh, and, um, and goes back to normal size and consistency. It's just a, a reflection of the hypermetabolic situation of pregnancy. For that nine months, the mother's doing a lot of extra metabolism for her and the baby. So I might add, thyroid in pregnancy is a very complicated topic. Uh, nodules, which are growths within the thyroid during pregnancy, can also be found incidentally. If it is a true growth within the thyroid, which is a nodule that I think she described as complex, the chance of a solid growth within the thyroid disappearing is very, very low. I think what Dr. Bianchi meant was if the whole gland is enlarged during pregnancy, as we commonly see, the gland can then shrink back to normal. But a growth within the thyroid going away is, is um, slim. All right. Thank you for that, that uh, clarification. So, Dr. Angar, let's move on to talk about treatments. Um, we've addressed this a bit, but is treatment required for all nodules? And what determines the treatment plan when we're looking at nodules? Right. So we, um, like I mentioned earlier, monitor nodules. Um, the plan usually consists of ensuring over time that they don't increase in size significantly. Uh, a biopsy might be part of the plan if the nodule meets the criteria. Most nodules, uh, since they are benign, and especially if the biopsy is benign or if the nodules are smaller, simply require ultrasound monitoring over time. So we do an ultrasound again in about six months and then ultimately once a year. A uh, lot of people live with nodules without them causing any problems at all. Sometimes surgery might be indicated if the nodules or the goiter is very large, causing local uh, pressure-like symptoms. Uh, but most of the time, we just continue to watch them for size. And I'm asked very often if there's any medical treatment for nodules, and there really isn't. There's no medicine that's going to shrink uh, growths within the thyroid. And we had a, a few questions come in, Dr. Iyengar. I'll address those to you. Uh, one was, if a patient, I'm paraphrasing here, so apologies to the person who asked, but if a person uh, experiences an increase in the number of nodules, but these nodules are not growing, does that make you more likely to pursue treatment? So it's not unusual to see more nodules develop over time because nodules are inherited. Um, so if it's in their genetics to inherit it from somebody else in the family, we do see more nodules appear over time. As long as the nodules are small, really nothing more needs to be done. They just need to be monitored with an ultrasound. If the nodule increases significantly over time, then um, they would need to be biopsied and watched a little bit closer. And we also had a question, can non-cancerous nodules cause problems with the pituitary gland? So there's a very interesting relationship between the pituitary gland and the thyroid. The pituitary gland is a little tiny gland at the base of the brain behind the nose that produces a hormone called TSH, which stimulates the thyroid gland to then make T4 and T3. When the thyroid makes T4 and T3, there is a feedback to the pituitary which tells it if the body is making enough thyroid hormone. So the relationship between the pituitary and the thyroid is mostly related to the thyroid's function, not so much the nodules. Uh, thyroid nodules themselves come on and grow independently of the pituitary. Very rarely a nodule in the thyroid can make too much thyroid hormone which then feeds back to the pituitary gland and shuts it off so that the thyroid is not stimulated to make more thyroid hormone than it should. All right, our viewers got a nice endocrinology lesson here today. Um, Dr. Bianchi, uh, uh, as Dr. Angar mentioned, if we do pursue treatment, it's likely to be surgical. So could you tell us a little bit more about what the surgical treatment options are that are available for nodules? So a good case scenario would be a, a patient presents after having a carotid ultrasound and a 
three centimeter nodules detected in the thyroid gland, and they go to Dr. Iyengar for evaluation. She does an in-office ultrasound. And I want to stress that ultrasound is something that doesn't penetrate the skin. It's just simply a, a, a soft probe that's held on the skin. There's no radiation involved and, uh, and is completely safe. It's the same type of ultrasound we use to look at babies in utero. So Dr. Iyengar, um, if she discloses on the ultrasound that there are some risk factors. There's calcium in the nodule. The nodule has some irregular borders. The nodule has a, a taller appearance than a wider appearance. Uh, then she may actually recommend an ultrasound uh, guided fine needle aspiration. And if that shows cells that look malignant or in the event of an indeterminate biopsy, one that shows genes that are positive uh, f indicating a high risk for malignancy. She may then refer the patient to me for th thyroid surgery. When I see the patient, I talk to them about thyroid surgery as an outpatient procedure in the vast majority of healthy individuals. It's typically an operation that takes two hours or less to remove either a portion or all of the thyroid gland under general anesthesia. And the patient returns uh, to the recovery room after the operation is performed. They recover for a, an hour or so in recovery and then for an hour or so in the ambulatory surgery department. And in most instances, go home on medications for pain and in some instances on thyroid hormone. The, uh, the operation uh, is uh, performed with uh, a high incidence in the United States and worldwide. Uh, rare complications of thyroid uh, cancer uh, surgery can include uh, difficulty swallowing for some period of time, having a hoarse voice uh, for some period of time after the surgery, and also uh, the uh, possibility that there may be some uh, disruption of the glandular uh, function of other glands in the neck that live very close to the thyroid gland that have to do with calcium metabolism. And very often we'll send people home on calcium supplements for a month or so after thyroid surgery. I see people a week later to check their wound. We go over the pathology and determine whether any subsequent treatment is going to be needed after the thyroid surgery. And Dr. Angar, uh, Dr. Bianchi mentioned a bit about the uh, uh, opportunity or necessity for various hormonal supplements. So could you just tell us a little bit more about long-term follow-up needs for someone who's had part or, or even potentially all of their thyroid removed? So the trend is now moving towards less aggressive surgery and good surgeons like Dr. Bianchi try to remove only that part of the thyroid that absolutely needs to come out. Um, so if only a portion of the thyroid needs to be removed, there is a great chance that the rest of the gland might be able to pick up and make enough thyroid hormone and the patient does not need to be on medication. We usually know this because we check thyroid function, which is a blood test about a month or two after surgery. Uh, if we do need to supplement the person with thyroid hormone, uh, it's usually after the whole thyroid gland is removed or if somebody has had radioactive iodine treatment which burns out the functioning part of the thyroid. Thyroid hormone supplement is very safe, very simple to use. It's cheap, easily available. It's just a pill that needs to be taken every day. And blood tests can be monitored, usually ultimately once a year, to make sure that the person is on the right dose of thyroid hormone. And uh, this is a question that is related, although not specific to nodules, but I thought we would ask it here. Uh, someone wanted to know, uh, they said they've currently been diagnosed with hypothyroidism. And is it true that once you start taking levothyroxine that you're on it for the rest of your life? So I think physicians need to be very careful, have a good discussion with patients about whether they truly need to be started on thyroid hormone. Unfortunately, a lot of the times, thyroid hormone is started without it really being needed to. So we need to make sure that there is uh, you know, a real reason to be started on thyroid hormone. Uh, there are some conditions like medications that can affect the thyroid or pregnancy that requires an increased 
uh, demand, uh, in which case we use thyroid hormone only for a shorter period of time. But um, in general, uh, if, it is, if the hypothyroidism is a result of either the whole thyroid being removed or radioactive iodine ablation uh, or uh, autoimmune hypothyroidism, a condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where the body makes antibodies that decrease the amount of hormone made by the thyroid, and that's usually a long-term condition then the person does need to be on thyroid hormone lifelong. And Dr. Bianchi, we had another question. Uh, someone asked if you've had thyroid nodules removed years ago, and they clarified that they were benign, and you've been on Synthroid ever since, how often do nodules continue to grow? And is there some routine checking that should be done besides the blood work for TSH, T3, and T4? And, and Dr. Angar, feel free to, to jump in on that last part as well. So in this instance where the patients had part of their thyroid gland removed and they're on Synthroid, uh, if nodules develop in the remnant portion of the thyroid gland uh, while on thyroid hormone, we do evaluate them in the same fashion with thyroid ultrasound. And if uh, there are risk factors on thyroid ultrasonography that imply uh, a higher than normal risk for thyroid cancer, then a thyroid biopsy would be obtained to uh, assess um, the cells for whether they look benign or malignant. And same thing applies to the blood test that you mentioned. TSH is the most reliable blood test that we use. We don't usually do a T4 or T3 level, but the TSH is um, the test that tells us if the person is making enough thyroid hormone. And we did have a related question just come in from a viewer. Uh, some, I'll address this uh, to you, Dr. Ayengar. Uh, which type of test is performed to check if the thyroid nodule is causing hyperthyroidism or low levels of TSH? Right. So the TSH is a hormone made by the pituitary gland. A low level of TSH is seen when the thyroid makes too much T4 or T and T3. So in hyperthyroidism, we see a high T4 and T3 and a low TSH. Um, these are the tests that we use to diagnose hyperthyroidism, uh, although when we treat hyperthyroidism, the TSH becomes the single most reliable test to monitor long term. And I might add with that, if uh, a thyroid nodule is felt to be uh, autonomously making too much thyroid hormone, sometimes a nuclear medicine scan will help to determine whether that nodule is hot or, or cold or uh, the same as the surrounding normal thyroid tissue. And that helps to determine what the functionality of that nodule is. And then again, we can target that nodule with either uh, surgery. Uh, we can do thyroid nodule ablation now with ultrasound and alcohol injections under uh, fine needle aspirated uh, um, ultrasound conditions, and, uh, and that's curative in most instances for the nodule that's over-functioning. We are almost out of time here, so uh, I will finish with this question. Um, someone asked, when should a patient see an uh, ENT versus an endocrinologist? And wrapped up into that response, perhaps both of you could talk about some of the other things that you treat aside from thyroid nodules, which is, of course, just a small part of your expertise. So I'll let each of you address that. Uh, Dr. Angar, we'll start with you. Sure. So I'd like to think of endocrinology as helping people with hormones and function and medication management, basically. Uh, Dr. Bianchi and I both see patients that come in with nodules. Our approach is more or less the same. We would both check thyroid function and determine if the person needs uh, an aspiration or surgery. Um, of course, I would never perform surgery myself. Uh, that's obviously your expertise, but I would help after surgery uh, to determine if um, you know thyroid hormone uh, supplement is needed and continue to monitor the patient almost lifelong. Um, as an endocrinologist, in addition to treating thyroid disorders, I also treat diabetes, which is the disorder of blood sugar regulation. Uh, there are other endocrine organs or glands. I already mentioned the pituitary gland, which is at the base of the brain. It's the master gland that regulates the thyroid and other endocrine glands. 
Some of the other conditions I treat are adrenal disorders. So adrenal glands are a pair of glands, one above each kidney. Um, and then there's reproductive function, so hormones like testosterone and estrogen, uh, as well as bone and calcium disorders, including osteoporosis, are conditions that I treat as an endocrinologist. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Iyengar. And Dr. Bianchi? And I might add that not all lumps in the thyroid are thyroid lumps. There are some lumps that are, unfortunately, cancer spread from other organ systems. We've seen people with thyroid metastases from ovarian cancer, from lung cancer, from cancers in other parts of the body. Uh, we still have to work through that. Sometimes uh, I have to do surgery to evaluate and diagnose those types of uh, thyroid masses as well. And there are other types of lumps and bumps that occur in the neck that are not uh, thyroid at all. They can be uh, tumors of the other organs in the neck, vas vascular tumors of the neck, muscle tumors of the neck, um, or uh, throat cancer, which is a common cancer among smokers and drinkers and becoming more popular and more common in uh, people that are non-smokers this day and age uh, with viruses that cause cancer. So I, I, as a head and neck surgeon, evaluate all lumps and bumps of the head and neck uh, and bring people, hopefully, to some sort of a treatment that will alleviate them of that, uh, that disease. Well, we are about out of time, so thank you everyone today for tuning in. Uh, to find an ENT or an endocrinologist affiliated with Holy Cross Health, you can visit holycrosshealth.org slash find a doctor. Dr. Bianchi, Dr. Angar, thank you so much for your time and your expertise today. It was a great information session for all of us. So, to those watching, thank you for joining us today on Facebook Live with Holy Cross Health, and we hope to see you again soon.